So let's make a, uh, a Photoshop document and turn it into an HTML file. Uh, if you look under week 14, I have all the files for it, and I just put them up a few minutes ago. I thought they were... Don't worry about it, because if you click this link here, it will take you to the original website where I just made a PDF of that site. And it was still up as of half an hour ago, so it should still be working. Uh, yeah, so if the PDF won't load, which it did for me, I was able to load it, uh, you will need the images.zip folder. Okay. But your PDF Acrobat plugin seems to not be working? Okay. So here's what we're going to make. This is a pretty simple HTML design. It's got a little search form. It's got this little area to be a slider type of thing. Um, and it's got a little three-column design. It, it looks kind of cool, doesn't it? Nice colorful. Um, it's got some crazy little things that look like they're all nice and transparent. Um, this cool fade down here. Um, and a very pretty logo, which you were supposed to be able to click on. I guess I forgot to do that. Uh, but this all started as a Photoshop document. Let me find it. It's okay, update it. I thought I had this. And then as you can see, I had to slice things up and pull these out. You don't have this. We're going to make this. Yeah, uh, and so it takes, sometimes it takes a day or two to do this tutorial, but to make the Photoshop document and then another day to um, slice it up. So if you, if really, if you just want to sit back and watch me do this and, and uh, do the tutorial on your own time, because you'll probably get lost. I'm going to move fairly fast, and this is one of the hardest Photoshop tutorials you'll ever do. Usually people tell me that they learn more about Photoshop doing, doing this tutorial than they did in all of GDT 112 and the uh, the Photoshop class. This is this one's tough. So first off, I'm going to close this guy out, and I'm going to start my new my new document. What size should I make my Photoshop document? Mm -hmm. What's the biggest size screen that you see nowadays? It's a little over two thousand. Yeah, this one, this screen, right now I have it set to 1024 by 768, but the resolution of widescreen monitors will go a little over 2080, some, somewhere in that neighborhood. Could you imagine trying to read lines of text that go entirely from one edge of the screen to the other? That would be horrible. So I still want to stick with my 960 design, but if you looked at the... oops. This don't show again, just update. There we go. There's actually stuff that's going to fall outside of the, the 960 design here onto the sides. So when I do this, ah, I'll go ahead and save that. I'm gonna make my design 2,000 pixels wide, and I usually do 1024 tall. I need to put my 960 grid inside of here. Um, so I need to figure out where 960 goes in here, and I do not have that math off the top of my head. If anybody is smart at maths, help me out. So we got... So my first one has to go at 520. I think I did that right. And then plus... 1480. There we go. Does that look even? Kind of does. Okay. Uh, you can usually check with the info panel. Is it so wide? All right. It doesn't like me. I'll put my mouse there to there. It says it's 960 wide. Woo! Yay. I did it right. Did it. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, so save it as a nice little little mock-up. Um, a couple of things that I, that I want to be able to do are um, well. I, let's actually break open the the tutorial itself, and I'll show you. This tutorial assumes that you know a good deal of Photoshop. So they'll say things like, put a gradient on with these two colors. They assume you already know how to do that. Um, you're going to find that a lot of the tutorials on the web expect you to have a certain level of expertise, that they don't have to sit there and say, step one, step two, step three, step four, exactly what button you click on. You're, you've been doing this for a while. I can tell you to create a new document of certain dimensions, and you, you know how to do it. Um, and I'm deviating from this just a little bit. Um, not everything is going to be quite the same as what they've got. So you can see they want to do this nice little gradient at the, at the background. Um, I have a couple of caveats about uh, gradients that you should be worried about. First off, whenever you do a gradient, you never really want to do more than do a gradient taller than 256, um, because that's when when you fade one color into one other color. Then if you don't have if you have more gradient stops in between there, you can get get these taller. Um, but from one color to another, the computer will take 256 steps to do it. Of just about any two colors, um, any two different colors. Pink to red would probably be a lot fewer steps. Now, what that means is if you um, if you have something that's a, th uh, a gradient that's a thousand pixels tall, fading from one to the other, you'll see blocks of solid color at points because the computer gets to color 70, but it's got to make 70 to 69 jump over like 20 squares or 20 pixels. So it's not going to be a smooth gradient the entire time. So what I suggest then is, first off, I'm going to move my point of origin. I don't know if you knew you could do this. There we go. I'm holding down shift to make it, but now zero. Zero, zero is in the upper left of my design area and not the upper left of the corner of the screen. You can do that in Illustrator and in Design. You are. Oh, yeah, now you're going to start learning some cool stuff. So, next one, view, new guide. I want a horizontal one at 256. That's how tall my gradient should be. I want you to know I'm still slowing this down so I, so I can explain everything. If I didn't have to s explain, uh, we'd be, yeah. It'd be crazy. What's that? Yes, you can. You are working with 16 million mm -hmm. colors. But when you're fading from one color to another, that suddenly limits all of your options. You're, you're working with two very specific colors. And the nature of pixels is that they have 200, I think it's actually 255 levels. So if, even the, the red phosphorus that's, that's on in your pixels, 255 levels of red. So that's what you're stuck with right now. That's, that's just a hardware thing. If a decade from now when they have some new color model, I don't know, maybe we'll have several billion colors to play with. Um, so they do have very specific colors. These are, uh, you can kind of play around with these when you're doing this if you have a different color scheme in mind. I think this one is incredibly dark um, and it's a little bit hard to see up on the projector, but it'll be okay on the, on the video. Seven nine two seven hundred. So I need seven nine two seven hundred. There we go. Those are my two, my foreground and my background color. If I take the gradient and I start here, and if I hold down Shift, it'll make it vertical. What is that? Oh, that. I chose the wrong one. Um, it yeah. Cool. No, it doesn't. That's horrible. It does. Okay, there's a bunch of different types of gradients. There's diamond gradients and things like that. I needed the, the up-down one. <laughs> All right, this is just going to be incredibly dark to see, but, well, no, it'll be fine on, on the video. If you turn out the lights in the classroom, it'll probably look a little bit nicer. Um, now, what I found with, uh, with this design is you can do the gradient as a background in CSS on our final HTML file. But Internet Explorer tended to have a really, really, really hard time with it. Um, so what I ended up doing, this is the older way of uh, 
before CSS gradients actually worked, we took a microscopic little slice in the upper right hand corner of this gradient and it really only needed to be one pixel wide and I need this slice select tool there we go and that's going to be my body background and now I know exactly what tag it's supposed to go on too so my body background, I'm going to give it a black, solid color black background. So the background will be black. And then I will take this little gradient image and I will repeat it across the top of the, the background. Um, now the, the way the backgrounds work is solid colors. If you specify a color, it goes on the bottom. If you specify an image, those go on top of the color. So basically I'm going to make it so that this dark red fades into black and then there's a black background that takes over. So it will look like it fades down to the entire page, but not really. Total and complete cheat. And I will save that before I lose it. Okay, the next thing that they want to have happen is this big soft brush background. And they just take some giant brushes, make them really big and fuzzy, slap some colors on it, blur them a little bit extra, and then you've got this uh, nice fuzzy little background to, to play with. So. Uh, oh, and then we add some images over them, and we pixelate them. Have you guys played with filters yet? Oh, have you gone nuts with filters yet? Yeah, okay. In college, you're once, you, once you find filters, you are supposed to go absolutely nuts with them for a little while until you get sick of them, and then you, you rein it in a bit. Um, so let me show you all this. I'm going to go grab brush tool. I need a giant, big, fat, fuzzy brush. Fuzzier. Ooh, too that's, fuzzy. That's it's a little bit, yeah. That's what I meant. It was size. All right, and pink. let's start. With, what's that? Pink. Fine, I'll do pink. Where's pink? Oh dear God. Oh my God. Where? Oh my gosh, Sean. That one? No, like. That. Oh, you want you want girly, pink. girly pink. Yeah. All right, doesn't matter. Let me do a soft blue tone in here now. Okay, if you want to go over this and make them uh, blur a little bit more, uh, Gaussian blur is the one where you get a lot of control. I know there's a ton of blur things under filter, but Gaussian is the oldest one. It's the one that gives you the most control. You can go pixel by pixel. So I'll do all that, and then this is, and I did that wrong. It was supposed to be on a layer. I will get pink. So there's that. There's some salmony, orangey type stuff, and then some sky blue. Just some junky colors to slap down. That is not happening on screen. Huh. Look. Well then. That's not. Yeah, that's just the projector being weird. Let me try a different color. See if uh, see if yellow makes that worse. Is that better? It's not there. There's still a halo on the left ones. Okay. It's just the projector is doing that. You won't even be able to see it on screen. Um. Sorry, I need to have this up on my second screen so I don't have to keep flipping back and forth. Uh, then we want to drop in. So there's going to be the big color in the background. Um, now I need to get this this pixelated pattern in, and it's just a couple of graphics. Um, oh, did I not blur them? They already are blurred, so I'm not too worried about it. Learning. This does the last one with the exact same setting, so you can do it multiple times. Apparently, this needs to go a little bit further. There we go. What I really want to do is bring the opacity down a bit so they weren't quite as vibrant. Um, then, file place somewhere in here. I've got these sitting on my desktop. Let me make sure that they're. Put that one there. 
this final product. Yeah, these are the two files that you should have that were in the, the zip file. It's going to be leafs and pixelated blue rectangle. Um, when you're placing files in Photoshop, you just want to do file place. I mean, where are they? Gosh, so much crap on these desktops. Leaves, there we go. Have you guys played much with smart objects? Smart objects are amazing. They are really, really cool. So, you probably don't understand them, right? I don't know what they do at all. Well, yeah, they're, they're, they're this odd thing. It used to be that when you placed a graphic in, what Photoshop did was it would, it would open a copy, it would highlight the whole thing, copy and paste, and, and you just get a, a whole new version of that image in here. And if you were to, let me rasterize this so you can see what goes on. Yeah. Make sure it's 256 tall. Okay. Can you do that on the sides as long as it's just that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Normally, the way before um, these smart objects came along, if you did this kind of resize to an image, do you see how awful that got? I lost all of, if I zoom in, you're going to see JPEG artifacting. It's all completely fuzzed out now. Um, what ha and now it's nice and clear that I've gone back to it. Now it's, still, now it's a smart object. What Photoshop does is if you double click on a smart object, you can go edit it by itself. Any changes that you make on this guy, save this, and go in here. Oh, oh there it goes. It took a second to update. So it's effectively, I can control this in another document. If I take this guy and shrink him down and bring him back up, it always refers back to the original document. It's a really great way to never lose resolution. You can put a high res image in, you can manipulate it and tweak it all you want, and then it never loses any resolution because of it. When this was... When you rasterize it, every change that you do, it loses some resolution every single time. So if you want to sit there and play with a design for a while, slightly tweak, every time you change the size of something, it loses resolution, loses resolution. This uh, smart object stuff prevents that from happening. It is incredibly useful. I use it all the time. So really, smart objects are just to be used whenever you are just tweaking and you don't want to lose. No, because the other thing that you can do is if you've got a whole bunch of copies of it on the page, you can go and edit one of them. Is that the other ones? No, and it will affect the other ones. So I can make one change and boom, all of them are updated. Mm -hmm. You saw how quick that was. Okay, so now that's not entirely what, that's smart objects. They're very, very powerful. Um, I really advise that you, I hate to say it, but go find a tutorial on them because they're really cool. Um, I can't explain too much more about them. If you want to do anything to these smart layers, usually you have to, you saw me do this a couple times, you have to rasterize them. And then they're not smart objects anymore. They're just placed in at that exact size. I'm going to run some filters over it, so I'm not too worried about, um, yeah. Uh, pixelate. Which one am I doing? Film grain and mosaic. Mosaic, that's what I want. They want really big pixel pattern. You know when you blur somebody's face out on cops or something like that? That's called mosaic. That's what this filter is, and you get to choose how big the cells are. How big your Minecrafty pixels are. Uh, the other one they asked, the tutorial says, is put on um, some noise... Um, film grain? That's supposed to be in noise. Um, I think film grain might be in the filter gallery. Will they move that? Uh, there's film grain up there. There it is. Yeah, this is all nice and transparent, so I can barely see it. I'm just going to add. It's just adding a little bit of texture to the to the images. If you zoom in, you might be able to see it. There you go. You see all the noise pattern on it?
So anyway, this is more just to add a little bit of texture to the background. Um, have you played with layers? Oh, what are these called? What? These things. Oh god, I can't remember the, the vocabulary term off the top of my head. Anyway, uh, these are, you can make uh, a layer behave differently depending on what it's sitting on top of. There we go. Matt, do you remember what these are called? Never mind, he's got his headphones on. <laughs> Why did, why can I not remember that? Wait. Yeah, well, there's a name for all of them. Blending mode. <laughs> <laughs> there actually is math behind these things, and you set, you change the blending mode of a layer, and it changes how that layer interacts with the layers underneath of it. They can uh, multiply, it actually multiplies the color numbers so that they come out a lot darker. Um, screen does sort of the exact opposite. Um, it makes them lighter. I, f I like playing around with these just to see if they get you a, a nicer effect, if they make something pop a little bit more, but they're pretty random. You can't just sit down and think, oh, I know exactly which one I, I would need beforehand. You just got to go through them and play. Um, okay. This is impossible to see. I'm going to try and switch this to a, a sort of a, a more white design so that we can actually see what's going on on the screen. better, but at least you guys will be able to see what's going on. Um, okay, the next thing is, this will be a little bit darker. The I do like this particular design. It's going to be a, a nice rounded rectangle will be my basically my container area. It'll be the background for it. Um, I'm going to use a rounded rectangle. You can set how wide the rounding is on the corners up here. So if I, I think three is going to be just fine and I don't need too much space at the top. I want this to come down to about the 200 level. Yeah. So I'll have 200 pixels up top for my design to uh, play around in. There we go. And control H will hide your um, your, uh, what are those guides? Well, I can I not think today. All right, some layer effects. I think that needs an uh, outer, uh, no, it needs a drop shadow. But I'm gonna make the drop shadow come from the bottom. There we go. Yeah, maybe that's not gonna work. Let's do outer glow instead. See if that does anything normal. Uh, what color should this be? Alright, I'm going to go with Sarah. Make Sarah happy and have a nice bright fuchsia. Yay. There we go. That's horrible. Um, now this is kind of supposed to fade into darkness. Uh, in this this particular design, so I'm, I'm kind of swapping that. I think what I'll do is add another layer that's going to be black to white. We'll do that, and then I can set that to dark lighten. There we go. So what lighten does is it it gets rid of the darker parts of a layer. They actually become completely invisible, and it only keeps the uh, the lighter part. So there's a black and white gradient on here. Maybe. Let me try something different. That's not working out too well. I'm going to try 
one of your gradients is always, the first gradient is always foreground to background, the second one is always foreground to transparent, so this might work a little bit better. Just gotta do it this way. That's kind of what I'm looking for. I just want this to fade out into, into nothing at the bottom. So what I'm going to do is set I changed it to white so you guys can actually see it on the projector. Um, in this design, I'm going to take this entire area and make it the background on the body tag. Nice and centered. But notice that it's actually larger than my 960 area. That's okay. I'm going to have my 960 centered in the middle of the page, and then I'm going to have this background that's also centered, but it's all going to match up. Um, the only way it won't match up is if your widths are, un are odd numbers. So if my, if this was nine, this will be 960, but if this big image that I'll slice out here in a little bit was uh, 1201 pixels, there'll be a, a weird jump as it, as the page stretches and it tries to center it. It'll kind of center it on every other pixel. It won't do it properly. Um, so whenever you're doing your background images, make sure that they're an even width and not an odd width. And I have no idea what it is right now. So, um, same thing. It, it should be fine. But, oh crap, I'm gonna have to do math again. I also need to make sure that I'm getting all of this stuff here. Oh, that's not gonna help me. Do you see how I did that? If you hold down control and click on a layer, you actually, the computer will automatically select all of the pixels on that layer. So, but the thing is, if any of the pixels are 50% transparent, or below 50% transparent, they're more than 50% transparent, it doesn't select them. They're, technically, it, the little marching ants don't show up. Anyway, um, what was that? It was 520? So let me see if I can get a slice here that's going to be... Oh, oh right, because that's zero. So I can just do 200 that way. And that's 916, 1070, 11... I don't know if I've got, if I'm doing this right. Thirteen eighty. That's good. And I think I've got exactly two hundred pixels extra on both sides. I think. I know that one's right. It should be thirteen sixty. You're right. It's still measuring from the upper left. It's not giving me the, the proper dimensions here. So 960 over to 1150. This is really not playing ball today, is it? Okay, that's at 960. It's 1150. It should be right... New guide vertical at 960, 1060, 1160. That's what I was afraid of. It still, it doesn't measure it right. 11. Should be right there. Ease. I just want pixel perfect placement of one guide. Is that so hard to ask Photoshop? Come on. It'll go 1679 or 1681. 
Okay, so let's try it. That sixteen eighty. Okay. God, I've never had that much trouble before with one of those. But now what I'll be able to do is slice up this sucker. Slice tool. And I can do the entire ten twenty four tall, but I probably don't need it. The there's some extra white space down here. But that'll be my. That'll be a second body background. Um, and in CSS, you can actually have multiple background images, and I have to look that up because I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, now, everything else is going to be within the, the confines. I've got this navigation bar area and header area I've got to create up here in the top. And the way they do this is actually it's going to be some pretty simple uh, text. They come up with some fake name. You guys can use whatever you want for this. Um, let me get all the styles for this. I don't want copper plate. I want... Just do Myriad. Myriad Pro Bold. Yeah, that'll work. Control T. Yeah, this will be fine. Trying to make it line up at the edge of the eye. It needs to be at like nine. There we go. Okay. Uh, so, got my fun little Griminati thing here. Oh, I need characters back. I need to adjust that. There's, um, do you guys play much with kerning in your designs? Do you remember that vocabulary term from... should have learned it in GDT 112. Yeah, I, I will tell you that whenever you design a logo, you should go in between every single letter and kern it. For example, look at the difference between... Look at the space between R and I here. And the G and the R. I'll even zoom in. Can you tell how off this is right here? Um, you will be you will be responsible for that. Uh, any professional is going to catch that in an instant. Um, so, which one is that? There we go. That's feeling better. Nope. Go back down. What I ah stop that. I need, I had this on optical. I need to have it on metrics. There's an option called um, optical where Photoshop will try to auto kern everything for you. Um, you just highlight a bunch of letters and set it to opti optical, and it'll try it. It's never great, but it it usually helps a little bit. And then I have to go in and manually adjust them all. They've got a couple of other fun things to do to this to make it look a little bit nicer. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find them all. It's going to be a bunch of layer styles, 
So to this Griminati layer, it's going to start off with a bevel and emboss. Uh, it's not going to be... Wait. It's 100%. 0, 0, it adds just a little bit of style to it. Inner bevel, smooth, 31, D8. Color dodge, white, at 40%, multiply at 20%. What I find the best layer styles usage is usually a whole bunch of them layered on top of each other. So that any if you deleted any one, you wouldn't see much change. But if you have six or seven of them, and each one is very, very subtle, they add up to a really nice effect um, that looks a lot more professional. So this one has uh, two more. I'm going to do Outer Glow. Normal. I think it's sort of a dark green color. Five, one, four, one, two, five. Sort of brownish. Look softer. It's going to be fifty-five percent zero normal. Everything else stays the same. And then gradient. Reverse it, 20%, 25% might be a little bit nicer. What do you think of that? Let me zoom in on it so you can see everything that's going on. The bevel gives it a nice little highlight color here on the sides, but it's very, very tiny, very subtle. Um, it's not like most of the bevel and embosses that I see out in the wild on the web where they're just as big, yeah, try and make it look as bubbly as possible. This is a, a very subdued, very subtle, very controlled use of, of the bevel and emboss. The gradient, again, is also really, really subtle. There's not much gradient to it, but it looks nice. Um, sure. Let's see. Yeah, I think it is. I think it's fine. Um, uh, let me zoom out to 100%. You know what? I think it. I think it's actually that the the tagline is visually kind of interfering with it. Does that feel like it's sitting on a baseline now? No. Well, <laughs> trust your eyes. That might help. Anyway, um, let me pull out my layers because then I want to show you layer styles. Have you ever played with styles? Mm -hmm. What you can do is you can set a whole bunch of layer effects and you can save them as styles. And if I just click new, I'll call it type treatment or something, and then I can grab another layer and it automatically puts those styles on it. If I change, if I come to my styles panel, oh no, I can just rename it. I, I can still go in and change them, but basically all those styles are saved here. You can kind of think of it as a class in CSS, um, except you can't edit the original. You have to get it right the first time, throw it in styles, and then you can drop it on anywhere else. It's basically the exact same as being able to do this. You can move a style from one object to another. You can even move just individual bits of a style around. Or you can hold down Alt and copy the entire effect from one layer to another. That should be pretty useful for you. You create your style once and then you just start dragging it everywhere. That works in Illustrator and InDesign.
Alright, in the upper right, there's supposed to be a little sign-up bar. Um, so I'm going to stick with some of the design that I've already established and use my rounded corner box. Um, throw you back in here. And it's supposed to have... <coughs> Excuse me. I'm done. Thank you. Sorry. Oh God! Look at my layers panel. We're gonna quadruple the number of layers. So I'm gonna start using folders to organize things. Have you used these before? Yes. Okay. They don't actually change much about. They don't change anything on screen. They're just a, a way to organize your layers panel. For example, I could do this group as my logo, and I could throw the tagline and the not the round and the Griminati thing in there that didn't go in. And then I can collapse that. So now those are all kind of grouped together. Um, these guys here, this one's my background layer. You know how you can't group you can't group a background layer, you can't move it around, you can't do much to it. If you double click a background layer and click OK, it becomes an unlocked layer. Or the shortcut for that is hold down Alt and double click on background. And now it's a regular layer that you can play with. And I can take all of these guys. And if you hold down Shift when you create a, a folder, it takes all the highlighted layers and throws them in there. And I'm just going to call that background because that just goes behind everything. I think that'll be a useful way of doing this. The other nice thing I like to do is if you double click where is it? Right click. Oh, you can change the a little uh, the little tabby colors here. It doesn't change anything on the screen. It's just a way for you to visually organize your folders. I use this all the time. When I have 150 layers in a Photoshop document, which is not uncommon, yeah, I need, I need them organized like this. Okay, so I actually did one thing a little bit wrong. I put that rounded rectangle in. Yeah, this one. I need that one to go into a new one. That one's going to be for sign up. Put that in there, and we'll make that one blue. Shrink this up and move it out of the way. Now you notice it's not blue. It's just that's just the little highlight color in the layers panel. Uh, they wanted it to be green, but I don't think that's going to work well with my design now. So I'm going to have to do something else. There is. I'm going to take this outer glow and copy it on there. That'll be fun. I think it's a little bit too pronounced now. I need to scale it back. Um, and then it's supposed to be Okay, when I'm doing fonts in Photoshop that are eventually going to go on the web, the worst browsers out there do not smooth the edges of your fonts. Most of them do now, but the couple of them still don't. Some of the um, smartphones still don't do it very well. And so, I think I've shown you anti-aliasing before. You should have seen it at some point. But basically what it does is it adds fuzziness around the edges here. Otherwise, if you have no anti-aliasing, it's just, you know, every single pixel is either 100% the color or nothing. Um, up close, this looks a little bit better, but far away, this it looks really blocky and kind of nasty. So, 
what anti-aliasing does is it, it basically blurs the edges and when you zoom out it looks smoother. It's a complete optical illusion. It's not real. Um, but Windows does this by default now. Internet Explorer was actually one of the first browsers to do this. <coughs> uh, I don't know if it matters about doing anti-aliasing or not anymore, but I'm going to turn it off so I know what text I'm supposed to put in there as opposed to what should be a graphic. That's a horrible color. I don't know. That's still a horrible color. I really don't want blue. All right, we're going to make this these fun little My Little Pony colors. Yay. <laughs> I think that's still a little bit big. I don't need that. There we go. That's a little better. Um, so that's nice and small, out of the way. Uh, that probably needs some kind of gradient on it, doesn't it? Hmm. In this one, I think so. So let's do uh, outer glow. Let's do a nice little. Oh, no, not that. Let's see it. All right, there we go. I'm okay with that. Uh, I think I should put that on this guy. If I do that, it's got to be really, really subtle. Not you. What do you think of the design so far? It's not amazing, but you can see where everything's headed. Uh, let's see. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about that. Navigation bar time. Now, pretty much when I do this, I'm going to do it as an unordered list in my HTML, so I'm not too terribly worried about what it looks like um, before that. And the tutorial goes into some pretty in-depth detail just creating the little dividers between each one. I'm not going to worry about that one just because it takes quite a while. If you want to try and figure that out, go ahead. Um, but there's a couple of things I can do here. I think I'm going to try this. I'm going to stick my nav bar in this guy, and that means I should probably have a new folder for him. Navigation bar. He should be green, I guess. Signups over there, backgrounds back there. Want this thing to be a little bit darker. This is going to be such an ugly mishmash of colors. All right, that'll be my nav bar. Now the thing is, I would actually like it, when I'm playing with this, I'd like it to be not rounded on the bottom. You actually have access to, the, to some of the same stuff that you have in Illustrator in Photoshop. So because this is a, uh, when I drop this shape in, it's actually a vector object and Photoshop does have the black and white arrows that let you pick up and manipulate stuff just like you can in Illustrator so I can actually there's the pen tools I can subtract that point I can convert that to a solid point I can go over here I can delete 
the same thing. Chuck that guy. Ooh, come back. And get rid of him. So you see how I did that? I'm just manipulating the vector objects. You can go into Illustr Illustrator, do that, copy the object over and paste it into Photoshop. I'm perfectly content working in vector in, in um, Photoshop. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Oh, but now this doesn't take up my... Oh, that goes down to 256, right? Yeah, I think that's actually fine. Well, we'll see how big my um, text is in this. It's going to be all caps. Home. About. Just got to figure out what they have. Services. Probably space that out a little bit more. This does get a little bit annoying because Photoshop doesn't have an automatic way to add spaces between words. But I can change the font to white, maybe slightly pink. <laughs> yeah, and since that'll end up being controlled as text, I'm not going to worry about putting gradients or going hog wild with with it. Um, yeah. That'll be my nav bar. Search bar. Oh, I forgot. I do need a little bit of area for this. This one is not going to be too too difficult. I don't know what color I'm going to make this, but yeah, we'll do that. Should be. I held down shift and alt as I duplicated it. I didn't create a, a thing for these a folder in my layers panel, so uh, they're all over the place. Alright, so this is nav bar. This is the rounded rectangle. These three guys need to be in a folder. And that's going to be search box. And you can see it put it inside another box. That's actually perfectly legit. You're allowed to do that. Yes, you can. I'll make that violet. Actually, that should be yellow, shouldn't it? It's going to be that gaudy. So as I add layers, I'm just trying to make sure they're all nice and lined up. I'm not screwing anything up too terribly. Actually, I think this these guys can be... Oh, here. If you grab a folder and hit Control t to transform it, it will transform all the things in that folder. So, there we go. I didn't have to stretch one and then stretch the other or group them together. They're automatically grouped. The next thing that they want is there's going to be this big slider thing and then these guys underneath. Now the the thing is that the slider is supposed to have this part that pops off. I'm not going to I'm not going to do that this time. I think I'm just going to I'm not going to worry about that. But 
I do need to worry about the fact that there is sort of this gap right here. This one. And it's over on the other side too. So my nav bar goes out over the edges a little bit on the left and the right. So in order to make that happen, make sure I don't screw up anything, I'm going to add... Yeah. I think it needs to be 30 pixels in. So what is that going to be? Five sixty, and then this one's at that's at fourteen eighty. So I need a view, new guide, fourteen fifty. They're not even. That's now they're even. Okay, maybe they're forty pixels in. I don't know. So now I've got my, this will basically end up being my padding on the inside of these boxes. Uh, so i got to make sure I know what I'm doing there. Uh, the, okay, so above my background, I'm going to create a new one, and this will be, I'll call it slider. And I think what they have is a, I think there's a graphic for it. Yeah, pixelated blue rectangle. I don't really like this graphic. But they gave it to us so we can kind of play with it. It's kind of stupid. Ah, I don't like that at all. Forget that. Scrap that. Uh, oh, you know what? If I've got this space here, I should probably have the same guideline underneath this. So... trying to figure out how wide this is. 41 pixels. I did. It's 40 pixels, so I need this one to be 245 to 285. There we go. Now it should be... Now it's a square. Okay. In my slider, I make a new layer. What's up? Can I leave this with you? Sure. This is done. Just put it up wherever. Last year we put it up oh, okay. in there okay. and it gets people okay. to sign up. Okay. Oh god, how big, how tall does this thing have to be? That's going to be kind of arbitrary. I'm just going to make something up for this. I think the info panel will help me. Right now, okay, my info panel, I don't know if you could see it, but right here it's telling me it was 350 tall. So I think that's a good size for this. That'll be perfectly fine. Um, it's not going to be this color. Oh, my God, because I'd like for people not to lose their eyeballs. Here's what I want to do. I'm kind of playing around at the moment. I'm not exactly sure what it is I'm going to end up creating. What are you doing? Go away. Internet Explorer, go away. What is he doing? No, just double Crap. Why did it do that? That was 
afraid so a key on my keyboard was stuck or something. All right, sorry about that. Um, yeah, my F1 button is stuck. I don't want help. Go away. Are you kidding me? I think my keyboard is actually broken now. Ah! Are you s kidding me? What is it? Every time you try to press a button, it pulls up your health. I've never seen that happen before. Come on. I never, I never figured out. I haven't I saved it. yet. I've never learned how to fix that one. So. Save. Okay. Control Q. Holy crap. Okay, I think that was Photoshop's fault. Well, okay. I think I saved it without destroying my stuff. Let's see if Photoshop is still stuck in some weird mode. Okay. Oh, whew. I've never seen that happen before. <laughs> Apparently. What's that? Uh, okay, next thing I want to do is uh, I want to make this have like a little screenshot of a website or a product that we're selling or hawking or whatever it is you want to you want to think of. So what I'm just going to do is go to some other website. There we go, this would be fun. And print screen. In Photoshop, you can just paste right from there. Mm -hmm. The other nice thing you can do is under Photoshop, if you do File New while you have a graphic copied, it puts in the actual dimensions of whatever it is you copied. Mm -hmm. So you create a new file, it's the exact right size as what you copied. Yeah, I use this quite a bit. It didn't put it in as a... Um, uh, smart object, but I can make it a smart object. And it's convert to smart object. You just right click on the layer, it's a smart object now. And I can do all kinds of transformations to it, including transform skew. Where I can kind of put, a, put it into perspective a little bit. And I wish I'd zoomed in a little bit more when I started this. Yeah. Now the thing that I like to do with uh, these types of designs, take this guy, hello, flip him, and then skew him again. So that they line up. I can then take this copy one set its transparency really low. Maybe, maybe push it down a, a few. And it looks like there's a nice little reflection, like it's sitting on a glass surface. The only problem, of course, is that I got all this extra crap down here, because when a reflection, it should fade out into nothing. Um, the way to do that is layer masks. Have you played with layer masks? In, in the first year that you're using Photoshop, layer masks are what are the distinction between an amateur and a professional. They're absolutely one of the most crucial things to learn in Photoshop. Layers are pretty okay, but masks are what, once you can show me you can do a good mask, then I know that you're on your way to being a pro. So what's a mask? Uh, it's basically you can paint with invisible ink on a layer. If you're used to Microsoft Paint, there's this horrible, awful little eraser tool. And I make sure to never teach it to you. You should never, ever, ever use the eraser tool. It's like 1% of the time you should use it. Instead, you should use these layer masks, which is, you can see it's a little gray box with a white circle in it. And with it, you can paint 
black and white on a layer. Wherever you paint black on here, the image disappears. If you swap the colors and paint white, it comes back. There you go. Get it all back. So that means if I swap this down like here, I can sort of slowly fade it away. I need to bring it back some more. And I think the brush is just a little bit too large now. There we go. So I can kind of paint with this guy. And, get, and if I do, whoops, I did too much, I can always swap the colors and bring it back a little bit. Brush X. Somehow that's still too far gone. Yeah. Actually, that's really what I, want, I think I want to do. Um, that one. There we go. Now it's a lot more subtle. I can do it tiny, tiny steps at a time. Can you even see it now? Yeah, it's still there. Here, um, they have a little bit of silly text that's supposed to go into it. It doesn't really mean anything. I'm going to drop this in, um, and then I'll let you go, and we'll finish up the rest of the design on next Monday. I'll have the video up. But uh, let's see. Lorem ipsum dolor sit. Met. Uh-uh. This congressman named Ed Balls, he just tweeted his name, Ed Balls. That's it. That's all he knew how to do? No, it was, he did it on accident. And oh. So it became like this internet meme where it was just like, people would just tweet Ed Balls. And someone would okay. be like, Lord, and so with Ed Balls. It's like Ed Balls. Ed Balls, balls Ed Balls. Balls, Ed Balls. And Ed Balls, Ed Balls. It was so funny. Oh, oh, that text looks awful. All right, this will be a graphic. Oh, whew. I really do hate un text that doesn't have. Uh, yeah. some things about this. Okay. So on uh, on Monday I'll finish up this tutorial. If you guys want to get started on this and try this design for yourself, um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be finishing up. We got a few buttons to drop in on in here. But there's going to be a little three column design and then a footer at the bottom. That should take about 15 minutes on Monday to do, and then uh, I will start turning that into a uh, HTML document. Should have that done by Wednesday. So it's just going to be demonstration of this. So all of that is just a mock -up. Yeah, I haven't made any HTML yet. But once you get good with, with Photoshop, it's much easier for me to pass this back and forth between a client, trying to figure out what they want, rather than slicing everything up, coding it in HTML, and trying to figure out what they want there. Photoshop's a lot more fluid for this kind of stuff. 
Yeah, and then I'm ready to go with slicing as soon as the client says, yes, this is what I like. Okay. 